All right. Good morning. It is January 7th. This is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee meeting. And today we are looking at the child care financing. We, we've started a great deal of work um, around child care, workforce financing, and trying to keep our centers open for folks, um, especially during this time of, of the surge um, and previously during the emergency. So uh, thank you all for being here to testify. Uh, we have members of the administration. Um, I'm sorry, my phone rang and I just turned it off. I apologize for that. Um, so but why don't we just dive in? I think what I asked Katie to do initially is um, briefly go through a little bit about um, some of the reports we have in committee and then where we are with uh, 171. Katie, you just had a couple things you wanted to add. Sure, good morning, Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Counsel. So Senator Lyons asked me to put together um, a quick overview of the reports that came out of, um, or that are required pursuant to Act 45. Um, I have a quick handout. If you don't mind me sharing my screen, I can probably get through it in about three or four minutes. Oops, I don't have screen sharing ability, Erin. Oh, now I do. Okay, thank you. There we go. Can you see the document I have up? Yes. Okay. Um, so I think you're mostly interested in financing this morning. So I'll go over the first few reports quickly. But just to remind you, you spent an awful lot of time on Act 45 last year, Child Care Systems and Financing, and there were a number of report backs that you asked as part of this legislation. Specifically, Section 7 of the bill asked for an evaluation of three um, early childhood workforce programs. So there was um, a program on scholarships for current um, providers, scholarships for prospective providers, and also a program on student loan repayment assistance. So those reports don't come in until October 1st of 2015, uh, excuse me, 2025. Um, and then the next report, Section 10, this was a plan on the proposed child Deve development block grant and child stabilization grants. So this has already come in. It wasn't due to this committee. It was due to joint fiscal on September 1st of last year. And then there is the section 12 report on attendance based model versus the enrollment based model in the CCFAP program, child care financial assistance program. And that report is coming in on July 1st of this coming year. And you also have another report coming in July 1st of this coming year. That was a report in section 13 of the bill. And this is the child care and early education systems analysis study. And if you remember, you um, as part of the legislation, you asked Building Bright Futures to hire an independent consultant to do this work. And that work looks at emerging needs of the system, stakeholder involvement, leveraging system strengths, existing needs and challenges in the system, anti-racism in the system, and data-driven accountability. So that report you'll see this summer, but the two items I think you're most interested this morning are the um, financing reports that are coming in. So you have um, a preliminary report that comes in December 1st of 2022. And then next year at this time, you'll have the final report coming in. So this piece of legislation required G JFO to contract with a consultant to evaluate the economic impacts and potential funding mechanisms to adjust Vermont's regulated child care system for children zero to five years of age, also with consideration given to the intersection of and the impacts on child care for children six to 12 years of age. And then um, I have some language about specifically what is going to be included in the final report. So the final report is to contain multiple financing options and public and private funding sources including um, a projection of the costs of expanding the state's child care benefit to more families, requiring commensurate pay for providers and utilizing the cost of care in CCFAP, and the feasibility of implementing each policy in Vermont, both separately and jointly. Also identifying and determining the feasibility of implementing stable long-term funding sources to finance 
an affordable, high quality early childcare system for children who are birthed through five years of age. And all of this work has to be done with certain goals in mind. So those goals are that a family does not spend more than 10% of its gross annual income on childcare, that the childcare providers receive compensation that is commensurate with peers and other fields, and also that the utilization of a cost of care model versus the market rate model in CCFAP. So those are the reports that um, are due that you should expect to see in the coming few years. And if there are no questions, I can take down this document. Questions about, and we can get that posted on our webpage. Yeah. I think it's already there. It probably, yeah, it is. <laughs> I should have said, yes, it is. Um, thank you, Katie, that's very helpful. Uh, did you have a question of clarification, Ruth? Go ahead. Um, thank you, Katie. Um, I'm just looking at the the final that the child care financing report, and this might be a question for Nolan too. too but um, who I thought was here? Yeah, he's here. Um, <laughs> um, the just thinking with my waiting study hat on um, people waiting <laughs> um, there. We put in our that report that to make sure that this study looks at the pupil weight that's in our education finance system for pre-K. It's a 0.46 weight, which is undoubtedly inadequate. And I don't see that specifically listed as something that study would look at. And I'm just wondering, does it mean they can't look at that? And should we add that to that or? Um, so Ruth, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I think this is a, this is a longer conversation about whether that should be added. And I know that both education and finance are looking at the bill, at the waiting study. And we, we might take a, a minute to go through that, a minute, probably take more than a minute to go through that, uh, but it's a good point to be raised, so. Um, yeah, I just wanna make sure that before the study is started, if we do need to amend it to make sure that they look at that, that they do. Um, but, I think you know, first it has to be, something that we ask for legislatively and that the 0.46 would be something that's in the um, funding process for schools. So we wanna make sure that we're not putting the cart before the horse, that's all. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused um, for the Don't record when I want the joint we're all confused. Office. Uh, and maybe this conversation Ruth and I can have offline, sorry, Senator Hardy and I can have offline, but are you suggesting that the child care study should take the waiting study into consideration? <laughs> no, just that specific issue about the, there's a wait for preschool students in our formula. It was not part of the waiting study. It was intentionally left out of the whole waiting study. I think because there was an, a, a, a desire to have it looked at within the full system of early childhood education and care. Um, so nobody's looked at it. Our pupil waiting task force um, talked about it and Cheryl, uh, Senator Hooker probably remembers this as well. And our conclusion was it's undoubtedly inadequate, but we didn't take all the time to, to go through it because this financing study was gonna happen. So Nolan, if you and I want to talk offline about what yeah, more the implications gonna... of what it might mean and if we need just like to insert a little bit of language to make sure that sort of gets in there, that would be helpful. And that, that's a discussion that the committee will have to have and also the education committee. So yeah, it it's, would... a, it's a it's a I think it's laudable actually that it that the your committee and task force went through that discussion, but we're going to have to take it through the committee process. So I think a conversation with Nolan offline would be helpful. Sure. And then uh, we'll see where it goes from there. And, and if I may, it's actually a good segue into what I was gonna, wanted to sort of add on to Katie's report that initially the, the, the bill had JFO contracting by July. So there was no money in the bill because the idea was that it would be a 23 expense and not a fiscal year 22 expense. Um, we, uh, after conversations with folks, we actually realized that it needs to be done sooner. And so we have, JFO has a proposal 
in budget adjustment to um, get the money sooner so we can put the RFP out within the next few weeks and then try to have um, a contractor up and running maybe by April. And that would give them a few extra months to do the work because we figured that the, the amount of work that needs to be done should need, need more time. So I just wanted to let folks know that there is a proposal in BAA to move to, to, to try to do it sooner, to have more time. Yes, good, thank you. And I know that's in human services. They're talking about that on, uh, in the house and we'll look at that when it gets to us. So there's a lot, there are a lot of moving parts here, but I think our goal today is to see where the administration is uh, with their contractor and how things are going with the initial financing discussion and then perhaps weighing in on some it may be that you have suggestions going forward for legislative language, but uh, I'll leave that. I leave that to the administration. So thank you for being here. Uh, we have Commissioner Brown, we have Deputy Commissioner Gray, um, Michael Blanchard, and Katerina is here. Now I always say your name incorrectly. It is Lysias. 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 Thank you for asking. All right. Thank you. All right. So uh, I'm, I think that you folks probably have a, uh, a team process here. So why don't you, uh, Commissioner, take it over. Oh, good, good morning to the committee and happy new years. I'm actually glad to have our partners back and collaborating and we're happy to be here this morning. Um, yeah, we're here today to talk about the status of the first phase of our IT project um, to replace the uh, uh, BFIS system in the Child Development Division. Um, our goal and, and work with the vendor was to have that roll out um, for October 1st, which would have allowed us to put in a new rate structure, what we refer to as the flip, which would have um, uh, changed the co-pays and reduced the out-of-pocket expense for family, for many families um, in terms of uh, affordability for childcare. Um, there were many complexities um, in rolling this out in general, but it also complexities by working remotely and through the pandemic and our vendor was not able um, to hit the October uh, 1st deadline. And so we worked with the vendor to try to um, evaluate the functionality that would be essential um, for a go live of that first phase of the project. And um, so that we could, what in, in, um, in IT land, and Michael could refer to this as what we call a minimal, uh, minimum viable product to go live with. Um, and so as, as a result of that, some decisions were made to try to reach a goal of, of having a system available in, in mid to late December. And so with the work of our vendor who actually really um, through additional resources and worked long hours into the evening and weekends um, was able to deliver a system that we could go live with in, in, in mid December. Um, it was missing some functionality that we had hoped to be able to deliver in October. Um, uh, also at that time, um, a decision was made just given the last minute flurry of fixing um, what we would refer to as bugs or, or, or little issues as, as we were doing our final testing. Um, we wanted to make sure that the, I think one of the most important phases of an IT project are making sure you have trained and skilled users on the new system. And so um, in, in that last minute flurry of fixing defects and bugs, we weren't able to um, finalize our training materials. And so it, um, I made a decision to slow it down a little bit to make sure we could do training materials and do a thorough uh, training of our partners who would be doing that system with a rollout in early January. Um, what we found in training and bringing partners in to train on the system they quickly identified an area of one of those pieces of functionality that was not delivered, um, which gave them concern. And, and I think we've heard from others, which is the ability to backdate an application, um, which allows us then during that backdated period to pay for that childcare, which could for some families mean up to a, a hit of $500 or so of out-of-pocket expenses 
if we don't have that functionality. Um, we evaluated whether we had the ability to do a manual workaround with that piece of functionality. Um, it was determined it wouldn't be feasible for us to do something. Um, and so in talking with some key partners, uh, uh, other, you know, some of our key chair, chairs and legislators, you know, we paused the rollout and are, are evaluating um, a couple other approaches while we work with our vendor. Um, and Michael's here that can um, fill you in on that piece um, of like, what would be the time frame uh, for them to add in that one piece or a couple pieces of functionality so that we could go live with that backdating. The other piece we're evaluating right now is we have those funds available that we're gonna be implemented with that rate flip. Um, we're also evaluating how we could in our current system do a temporary rate increase while the new system is finalized and roll that out. Um, we initially thought that could be very complex. We're now, as we work through that, believe it's not as complex, um, although there it is not without risk. Um, given um, the age of the system and the platform BFI is, is on, anytime you touch that system, you, you're concerned about what ghost you're going to raise from the machine, uh, you know, the doctrine of unintended consequences. Um, but um, we believe that that is feasible. So th that, that's the conversation we were hoping to have with the committee, just to update you, let you know, we certainly um, want to make sure we don't financially harm families and also support families with that increased financial relief. Um, it, you know, it's unfortunate where, you know, we are where we are with the system, but we are very close. And I think, you know, we have some decisions to make and obviously we want to have that conversation with the committee this morning. But we do have a couple of things and Michael, I'll turn it over to you to talk about the work you're doing with our vendor called Bright um, regarding that, that backdating and what that level of effort and time frame would be to bring that functionality uh, um, to delivery. Um, thank you. Happy New Year's, everybody. Uh, for the record, Michael Blanchard, uh, DCF IT Director. Um, yeah, I would say that currently, as Sean indicated, we're engaged with the vendor. And there's really, I would say, maybe three use cases that we're really focused in on in terms of trying to determine the timeline implications of rescoping them, if you will, in that um, it, as Sean indicated, in October, we sort of regrouped and descoped various features to try to um, create a viable plan to hit a go live date in the December timeframe. And it, as Sean indicated, some of these descoped items, I think we've gotten feedback that maybe we really shouldn't have descoped them. And um, at this point, the one that Sean referred to, the one issue of the backdating of the applications, we've um, shared that information with the vendor, um, we've answered all their questions, and now their preliminary in indication was that it, it wasn't a huge feature or functionality to add back in. And so I'm optimistic that within the next week or so, we're gonna get that uh, level of estimate and, um, you know, timeline implication. We don't have that right now, but um, our vendor is working on that one specifically. On a couple of other items that were also indicated, namely attendance adjustments for families that are already enrolled, you have the scenario where it could be a positive attendance adjustment, it could be a negative attendance adjustment, it could be a, a zero dollar attendance adjustment. And we're looking at those three different flows. Um, the negative um, attendance adjustment flow has a lot of complexities. Um, it deals with recoupments. Um, so we're really trying to understand of those, you know, what the complexity is. Um, and that one, we're not quite as far with the vendor. We're still answering their questions around the functionality and um, we still have some outstanding, you know, discovery sessions with them to make sure that we really are fully communicating what is needed so that they can give us that good level of estimate. Um, you know, our plans are to finish that, those discovery sections up next week. And, um, and then the vendor will be in a position to also give us a level of estimate and timeline implication of doing and adding in those three different flows. And that's basically where we're at. Um, 
as Sean indicated, initially I was a little skeptical about making changes to the existing system for changing the provider rates, but upon investigation, it looks like it should be fairly straightforward. So right now we're running some experiments in a um, test environment to try to give us more uh, confidence that we're not gonna you know, adversely affect that system. Um, but that is looking very optimistic at this point. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, was there other, were, did you wanna have other uh, comments, uh, Commissioner or Michael at this point? No, I think we've covered kind of the points we wanted to touch on of the status of that project and some of the decision points yes, we're good. at right now and, and avenues we're exploring and um, certainly interested in answering your questions and hearing any concerns. We have questions. Um, <laughs> and I'll just start out with a couple of that may not be too difficult to answer, but um, so as this is going on and you're building functionality into the system, uh, <laughs> you're using the system. And so what is the effect currently? Is this having a negative effect on folks to access the support that they need? as you're going through uh, this, as the vendor, I, I, assuming the vendor's going through the process with you. So as this is going on, what are the pros and cons? What's the negative effects out there? And then is there anything good happening with, with people seeking access to daycare services? Financial. In terms of uh, the impact, we are still using our existing BFIS system that, that has been in existence for quite a while, and the new system is not in production. So in terms of the impact on the system, other than the rate flip, um, we also, to just to inform the committee, um, um, during the Christmas holiday, we had some outside influences try to penetrate our BFIS system on multiple occasions one day. Um, it, they were not successful. Our, our ADS staff were monitoring it and we brought the system offline. I believe it was right before New Year's and they um, worked over the New Year's holiday to increase some secure, increased security functionality. And I would defer to Michael on, on that work and then we would be able to bring it online. So during that period, providers were not able to access the system over the New Year's holiday. Um, we don't believe there was a big impact and there was no um, intrusion into our system or, or access to any, so we didn't have a breach of any data, but there were several attempts during a, a one day rate right during that period. And Michael, I would defer to you to talk, to, to speak to that. Yeah, I, I think that's accurate, Sean, that, you know, we are, um, you know, adding in additional security measures based on activities we've uh, noticed. Um, and this isn't the first activity that we've, um, that we're, you know, trying to remediate from a security perspective. And I guess to Senator Lyon's point, one of the things that we've um, added into the scope um, that previously wasn't in that minimum viable product MVP definition <clears throat> is that we, um, are basically replicating the help desk fun functionality of BFIS in the new system in a secure um, and sustainable manner. So we're trying to make it easy for those external users to be able to request help when they need it and doing it in a secure way. So that was actually a, a totally separate issue relative to what um, Commissioner Brown was referring to. So <clears throat> it is definitely something that you know, we are um, very focused on there's going to be in this new system um, a different sort of global mechanism of signing on using Okta, our single sign-on application platform. <clears throat> and um, we just want to make sure there's a lot of benefits with that system, but also we want to make sure that for those um, providers and family members that are struggling to even get into the system that they have the support they need so that they're not frustrated. Oh, well, that, thank you. Uh, I did not realize that you'd had attempts at breaching. So 
that nothing like a little extra work at a time when everyone doesn't want to be doing that. So thank you for the work that you did there. And I, I do have two more, a couple more questions, probably even more going up forward, but just in terms of the, is there an increase in the, in the money needed to accomplish the goals? Is the vendor able to, to do the work within the contract that currently exists? Michael, I would defer to you uh, as, okay. as someone ma over managing that contract with the vendor. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I, I would have, um, you know, I, I believe that our uh, contract vendor has been doing an exceptional job and has been working very diligently, as Sean indicated, late nights, weekends. Um, and it's one of these things that when requirements are initially defined for a contract, they tend to be fairly high level. And then when you really get into the details of what you need to know to actually start programming, the complexities come out. And a lot of those have come out um, through those subsequent discovery sessions. And um, this is a fairly complex you know, application. Um, and the vendor has, um, you know, taken our direction in terms of what needs to be in there and, and not be in there for MVP and has just gone on and built it regardless of whether or not, you know, um, it was totally clear whether or not that work was in or out of scope of the contract. So I think we're at a point here where um, potentially there will be change requests, um, you know, forthcoming as we start, you know, getting really close to that, you know, go live date. So I think it's really the best answer I could say is to be determined. The change request process is that vehicle for um, adjustments, you know, in terms of scope and cost. And um, at this point, there is no outstanding change request, but they, they may be forthcoming. So, so at this point, they, they, there's not been a conversation about additional resources needed to complete the project but it Good. wouldn't be unexpected to see those <laughs> in the future, perhaps. Just so. walk, tread lightly. <laughs> uh, so, um, and, and then another question. I know that, you know, we've had a timeline for implementing this program and we're looking at, you know, we still have 2022 and then into 2023, but what, <clears throat> what, is, what is the timeline that you're looking at now for completing <laughs> completing the work. No, it's probably a difficult question to answer at this point, but have you restructured the timeline for the work? And are we looking at a successful completion within the time specified in statute? I, well, we're, we're still reevaluating. I mean, this has certainly pushed us back a little bit, Senator. And I think our focus has been... Uh, on the task at hand, but we are cognizant that we need to shift very soon to start planning the next phases of this, with the understanding that we want to be well positioned, you know, depending on the outcome of 171 and, and the other work that's happening in this space, that we're fully um, prepared with a new system to meet those needs, which is actually will be much more nimble than the current system to, to whatever um, outcomes, you know, and program changes happen as a result of uh, 171 or any work at the federal level as well. Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask about the federal level and what you're hearing. Uh, I don't think we're, we're hearing anything. Any of us are hearing anything at this point regarding. Well, I, uh, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, well, you know, we, you know, and kind of the little bit that we've been hearing, Senator, um, is that while there are certainly, you know, that the, the overall bill that they were hoping to get out that include a lot of increases for child care kind of has stalled that there's probably uh, that there's work and conversations happening about um, portions of that bill where there was m more agreement than not between the two parties and I think child care was one of those areas and Katerina can jump in here as well she may have a little bit more to add but that child care was one of those areas where I think there was more agreement than not and that we might see movement on there in, in the in the coming months but I would differ Katerina I didn't know if you had anything else to add there I think that's accurate. Uh, what we have heard um, 
you know, with the stalling of Build Back Better is that there is still consensus around child care and the universal pre-K, but they're just trying to determine the funding amount, um, which does look like it will be much less than what it, what was originally proposed. Okay, thank you. That, um, and please, you know, as you learn more, uh, Katerina, if you don't mind keeping us posted or, you know, at some point we may, if you think it's valuable to come in and uh, talk with us and particularly as we go forward with budget considerations, because we do re make recommendations from this committee, that would be very helpful. Absolutely. Thank you for the offer. Okay. So committee questions and Senator Hardy. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I just had a clarifying question. Um, Commissioner Brown, you mentioned that you're trying to do a rate increase in the old system and you think it will work. Um, I appreciate the complexities of trying to make an old system work. And then at the same time, you're trying to update the new system to include this functionality to be able to backdate eligibility. And so there's sort of this overlapping kind of thing going on. Are you updating the rates in the old system as a temporary fix? I, can, you under, can you explain a little bit more about that sort of overlap and what the rate increase and the backdating functionality and how they interact or do they not interact? Well, they, the, the, two, the two rates that, that we were moving to would look much different. So the system allowed us to do things the uh, old system do not in terms of co-pays and out-of-pocket and, you know, families with different numbers of kids in, this, in child care. Um, so we have a lot more flexibility in the new system of how we can design and implement rate structures. The old system it is, is much more linear. And so we would use the same dollar value and try to um, use those dollars and try to set a rate in the new system that um, provides similar financial relief to families per family uh, as, the, as the new rate would, but it would just do it in a different way. Okay. And then, and then hopefully once we're able to go live with the new system, we could then implement that new rate system, whatever those are at that time. Okay. So once yeah. the new system is live, you would do it yeah. quote unquote correctly. It's just, you're yes. trying to do this sort of band-aid solution yes. in the old system. I get it. Okay. And you mentioned um, training, uh, frontline training for people who are going to be using the system because as you may know, the, this conversation in large part started because I heard from a constituent who was trying to use the system. Mm -hmm. So could you tell me a little bit more about your training efforts and how you're gonna bring people along at the frontline level? I think this is a perfect opportunity for De Deputy Commissioner Gray to jump in to respond to your question, Senator. Thank you. For the record, Miranda Gray, Interim um, Deputy Commissioner for the Child Development Division. And thank you for the question, Senator Hardy. We are um, currently, we're looking at <clears throat> um, mapping out. So once we have that timeline from um, our vendor of when they think they would be able to add back in this functionality, that will also help us make sure that we um, provide a robust time for training um, because it is a new system that's functionality is very different um, from our current system. And so we want to make sure um, that they do have the opportunity to get in there um, and to ask questions. And so we are looking at um, the team that we are, are pulling together. Um, currently, we are doing a little bit of rebuilding um, within our, our division um, <clears throat> of who can hold that piece um, to make sure that they are getting that robust training. Okay. And do at the local level on the front lines, does it require any outlay on their part? Do they have to upgrade their computer? Do they have to have a different kind of, do they have to buy any software? Is there an expense at the frontline level of using this new system? Right. And so I will ask Michael to, to jump in here a little bit. I know when we have um, just um, did testing before the holiday, one of the um, I'll call it a pain point that we found um, was that you have to have um, a 
designated phone number. Um, but I think we've already found a solution um, to that problem um, because uh, what we found is that not all of our providers do have a a landline that is for their sole purpose. You can't use one phone number for multiple people. So if we had two eligibility specialists and one entity, that wouldn't work. Um, and not everyone has access to cell phones. But I do believe, and this is where I will turn to you, Michael, that there is a special key um, that we have the ability to purchase that will um, allow people to be able to access our system. Okay, sure. Um, just to add on to that, I would say high level response to your question, Senator Hardy, is that it is a cloud-based solution. So really, for the most part, if they have a computer that uh, is connected to the internet, you know, modern browser, there really shouldn't be any out-of-pocket expenses to speak of that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, but I mean, actually, that's a in, really... In the scenario that Miranda was referring to, it's really around... Michael, you're you're you've you're going in and out. It's always at these moments, the irony. <laughs> <laughs> Are you an IT person? <laughs> I am, yes. Uh, go ahead. You're you seem to be freed up. Nope. I, I do. But I I still live in Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> our, in, our, our internet service in Vermont is not something that my skills can, can address. <laughs> but I'm sorry, so can you hear me okay now? <laughs> Let's go, yeah. go ahead, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so it is a cloud-based service. So basically most users, families and providers just need a browser, um, PC connected to the internet. Um, in the use case that Miranda was speaking of, it was really around an authentication um, scenario where we had some agencies, um, eligibility specialist agencies that, didn't have their own phone number, right? They shared a phone number at the office and um, the Salesforce platform requires two-factor authentication. And part of the process of setting up that two-factor authentication application is you need a phone number to activate. Mm -hmm. so, so long story short, there are mm -hmm. solutions where there are little security tokens that you can provide those eligibility specialists or that agency, um, they're fairly inexpensive, like $25 a piece. And I think for the scenarios where um, those are needed, that I think um, the plan would be to just provide those agencies with, you know, enough of those tokens so that they can get into the system. That is correct, Michael. The state would uh, provide those tokens to the providers. <laughs> is there a way that the federal... Uh... ARPA dollars can be used for some of this. I mean, I'm not thinking just of the tokens, but if there are some uh, hardware or software needs out there. Uh, we can certainly look into whether the um, American Rescue Plan ARPA stabilization dollars that we just started rolling out in November are an eligible expense and we can work with the providers on that if, the, if they are, but I don't know the answer directly. I and mean, we don't have a finance person with us this morning, so I apologize. It's okay. All right, no, but uh, you know, we, we ask questions that are never answered, but it's fine. <laughs> uh, I just have to more, keep going. Yeah, I just want to sort of follow up. This is helpful. Um, and I guess related to the um, training question about how you're training frontline people who are using the system, um, this has been really helpful to me and I will certainly relay all this information to my um, constituent. How are you communicating what's going on so that the front end users know what's, what to expect? I think once we have a few more answers from the vendor, I think we will send out a communication to our providers with an update of where we are in our path forward and a time and a timeline of what to expect, whether it's in the old system with a rate increase and to families or or it would all be in the new system. And I think we're waiting for the, that final analysis from our vendor so that we can make those final judgments and decisions on the path forward. And then we would communicate that out to to everyone. 
Okay. I guess I would just encourage you more communication is better because people are wondering what's going on and worrying. There's just, as you know, a whole ton of anxiety out there in the field. Um, so anything you can do to ease that anxiety with just a, hey, we got this, we've, he we've heard you kind of message, I think that might be helpful, even if it's not complete information. <laughs> And perhaps we can do a couple uh, town meetings with folks too and answer some questions as well. That might be a more appropriate forum to share. I mean, we do other communication, but I think sometimes allow, allowing our partners to ask questions and, and is a good a good way to uh, ease fears as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, that, that, thank you. That's a, those are all good suggestions and good question, good suggestions, because I think if if the communication doesn't happen, then this is what happens. We end up here looking at the process that you're going through, and um, we'd rather look at the end product after all the glitches are taken out. So, uh, but we really appreciate the time that you're taking to uh, explain it to us. And I think, as Senator Hardy has said, uh, folks out in the field will be will welcome. Uh, similar information. Uh, other questions, committee? Wow. Is there anything else that we should know about right now in terms of uh, the, the financing piece that? Uh... Well, at Miranda, Deputy Commissioner Gray could perhaps just um the rollout of the stabilization dollars that were approved at JFO earlier this uh, last year, late last year, I guess in the yep. fall. Um, we are now have made a several months worth of payments on that. And Miranda, I didn't know if you want to give an update of kind of high level of, 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 of that program and where we're at. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Um, so we were able to in, implement our ARPA stabilization um, program. The first payments went out um, in November. So, uh, and we have had the December payment. I believe the, the third payment will be going out here um, with the next couple of weeks. And we stagger those payments out to providers. Uh, we're up to, I believe it is 78% of the providers um, that are accessing um, this funding source, which is really exciting. We are continuing efforts um, to make sure that every provider that is eligible um, for this money is um, able to access it. Um, just so that they have these resources um, to meet whatever needs that they might have. Um, and I think I, I haven't heard anything of late, um, you know, from providers, but I, I think that we um, tried to be very thoughtful about what it was that providers were saying that they needed. Um, and, and this was a very, um, uh, I guess I would say directed program in terms of like the money needed to go to the providers um, to be able to meet their needs and use the, the funds in the way that they needed. Um, so that's really what we tried to do and have a very simplified reporting process um, in order to be able to have this, this money flowing because we've also, um, each time we've run a program, try to have our lessons learned um, about what worked well and then what can we do better. And oftentimes it's just a lot of the reporting aspects, um, you know, we have things that we, we need to report to the federal government, um, but how can we um, gather that information thoughtfully so that it isn't taking a lot of time for the childcare providers who are often in classrooms at this point, um, because I've heard that a fair amount as well. So, and having a, a robust um, support network. Um, so making sure that if people do have questions needed help accessing that we were able to provide that support as well. Thank you. Questions for Deputy Commissioner Gray? Go ahead. <laughs> um, this funding, um, can you just remind me, this is directly to providers themselves for stabilization of their programs. This is not necessarily going, this is not the subsidy money for families. This is specific to providers. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, Great. And I do have one more question about something else, but I'll, I'll wait till we finish this topic. <laughs> Any other questions here? I guess the next question that I would have is, do we see a continuation of any of the stabilization funds coming to us? Any federal dollars in the next, I guess Katerina would be our expert here. So, oh. I would have to follow up with you for a response to that, um, okay. but I can do that. 
that'd be good. All right. It's certainly needed um, with the change in workforce and the loss of uh, caregivers at our child care centers. Um, people are having a tough time. So whether whether stabilization and stabilization funds can become important simply because we were talking earlier before we went online just informally about how uh, child care centers with the loss of one or two uh, workers then need to close a room or two rooms. And that means that maybe they have to send kids home. And so it's, or, or uh, limit their hours. So having the stabilization grants can help these centers stay alive until we finish our work on uh, workforce development. So um, that, that question isn't, isn't a light question. It's a really important one. And I hope Katerina, you'll be able to sort out some of that. Uh, you, can, you can go to Washington and bring home some dollars for us, but uh, just knowing what's there would be very helpful. Okay, um, any other questions in this area? Ruth, you had a question. I, if it, let's see how related it is and, uh, and then we'll, we'll see what comes of it. Well, since we have the commissioner and deputy commissioner here, this is um, uh, Deputy Commissioner Gray and I had a conversation about this earlier this week. And it's just, I know we're all hearing from families of young children in childcare about the um, inability to access rapid tests um, for their kids. Um, and I read, unfortunately, this week that the state only distributed half of the tests that they had for K-12 parents. Um, um, so I'm wondering, do you have tests that can be distributed to through early child care programs to parents? Uh, they're, they're the, the, you know, the age group that has not yet been vaccinated. And, and while there's not necessarily a concern for very severe um, uh, reactions in young children, they still can spread it and they can get very sick and wondering if you're going to be able to provide tests for young kids. Sure, I can, I can, I'll have Miranda jump in here. I mean, Dep uh, Deputy Commissioner Gray, um, and she's been spending a lot of time in this area and I think she has some information she can share with us. So. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Yes, and, and thank you, Senator Hardy. Um, there are a lot of logistics that go into getting test kits um, into the hands of families for their children. And I think we are extremely close. I'm hoping um, within a matter of a couple of days of being able to formally announce, um, you know, the logistics of um, where providers will be able to pick up test kits if they decide to opt in. Um, we know that um, people need choice. Um, so uh, if they decide to opt in, we will have um, test kits available for the two to five-year-olds. I think it's important for me to highlight um, that currently the test kits that we have available are not for children under the age of two. So there is still going to be um, an age group um, that we provide services to that aren't gonna be eligible for this. Um, but we are looking to launch tests for tots and we sent out a communication I believe it was Wednesday, you'll have to forgive me, it might have been Tuesday, the days are blurring a bit together for me this week, um, just letting providers the know. Club. Thank you. <laughs> um, letting providers know um, that this was on top of our minds. We have been closely working with the Agency of Education and the Department of Health um, since they rolled out test to stay in schools, um, and really we've just been waiting for um, the supply chain um, to be able to have test kits. Um, for this other population, but uh, we are getting very close. Oh, thank you for that. I, the uh, Senate Education Committee spent a great deal of time yesterday hearing from the Department of Health and the AOE about uh, distribution of tests and how that's happening. So having hearing that you are linked in with that process is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. This is great. Um, so uh, it is, we're, we're a little bit ahead today, which is terrific. Uh, the, as, as you said, that we don't know where we are in this first week of the session. And for you, 
that's been uh, folks in AHS, it's probably been a never ending stream, not just the first week of session. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna suggest that we take a, a short break. Uh, Katie, you are here. And I know that Jen Carby is coming in at 10.15 to go through some reports. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for your opinion on taking a break until 10.15. Does that work? Yeah, I think we, we need both of us to be here because we kind of yeah. trade back and forth as we go. Okay, so we'll do that. I think everyone, first, I want to say thank you to each of you from the Department uh, of Children and Families. This has been extremely helpful to us. And our goal is that folks out in the, in the real world and out in the childcare world are able to see this or understand what you're doing and to get some reassurance. I think it is critical that people are reassured at this time that things are happening to help them going forward. So thank you all for being here. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity and your time. All right. I'm sure we'll see you again. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Aaron. Thank you.